First of all, go to John chapter 15. We'll start there. It's good to have everybody here. Um, Sister Hyunmi, we're praying for you, sister. God's going to help you. I believe he will. And um, let's see here. Yeah. John 15, Ephesians 6, 1 Thessalonians 5, Mark 14, Romans 15, 1 Timothy, turn, up, turn to all those places. Okay. Oh, you already had them ahead of me. That's pretty good. What do you need me for then? Um, let's go to the Lord in prayer and uh, ask God to lead us. As we study his word, this is, I'm just going to continue on with some of the notes that I had from this morning about, uh, about prayer and uh, some of the things that God uh, has taught me about it. Uh, basically, he's taught me to trust him, to trust him, and uh, which sounds like that's easy, that's what we're supposed to do, um, but sometimes it doesn't come easy. I mean, I'll admit that sometimes it, to, to not trust, to put away the trust that we would have in ourselves and not do anything and then trust God alone that he's going to fix things. Um, it takes faith. It does. It takes it takes exactly that. It takes trust. And uh, this is one of those things that. Uh, I talked a little bit about during homecoming was your faith being on trial. Okay? And what, it, what that does is it finds out who has it and who doesn't. Because there's a lot of people out there say that they are Christians, that they believe in God, believe in Jesus. They don't trust Him. They do most of what they do, they do without letting God do it without awaiting God's instruction, all of those things. And um, so it's, it's a way basically for God to filter out who is and who isn't, all right? But let's go to the Lord in prayer. John chapter 15, we'll start there and let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, come before you today and we thank you, Lord, for uh, bringing us back again uh, to this service. We thank you, God, for the fact that Father, that we are praying to you is a manifestation, Father, of how true your word is. We can approach very boldly the throne of grace to find help in our time of need. And I pray, Father, that, uh, Lord, that you would guide us as we study your word, that you open up our eyes to it. Father, Lord, that you would teach us that we can trust you. We can have total confidence, total faith in you. That you will supply all of our needs. That you are a very good God to us. And that Father, sometimes you answer prayers very quickly. Sometimes you wait. So Father, give us wisdom and give us patience. And teach us to pray and to pray more often. To ask you, Father, for things that we can't do ourselves. And Father, maybe some things we can do for ourselves. We'd just rather have you do it anyway. You're that kind of God to us. And we pray, dear God, that you would help your people to learn to trust you as we pray. Bless your word tonight, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said. In John chapter 15, it's a place I've gone to many times. Um, this is where Jesus said, I'm the vine and you are the branches. And I want you to notice what sort of the summation of all this is. John 15, verse 1, I am the true vine and my father is the husbandman. It means he's the farmer. He's the one who owns the vineyard. He's the one in charge of it. What grows on it, what doesn't, and so on. And he says in verse 2, Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth 
more fruit. Now just very quickly, just to stop and think about those two verses right there. There are obviously people in churches everywhere. It's one of the reasons why so many people have uh, made Bethel their home church. It's because they've been to these fruitless churches. Produce no fruit, no evidence that God's power, God's real power is there. And God's power is not in how loud the music is. His power is not in the light show that they put on, the fog machines, uh, what the preacher says. That is not evidence of God's power. Evidence of God's power is a completely changed life. That's part of the evidence that, that God's in that, that God has, has taken somebody, and I mean completely turned their life around. Uh, you know, I could talk about my brother-in-law, Steve, or Keith Crumb. These are men that once God made that change in them, you could see it. I saw it. And uh, the people around them knew it, knew that that change was there. Okay, that's God's power, okay? Not the emotional response of the church creatures to what's going up on the stage. That has, no, that has nothing to do with God's power whatsoever, nor does it have anything to do with whether a church is dead or alive. It is the change that God makes in people. And so once he saves people and makes that change, then it is up to God to look at your life. Not you looking at everybody else's life, deciding what should and should not be there. God looking at your life, examining it and saying, okay, this part here, we're going we're gonna to take that away. We're going to take that out of who you are. We're going to cut that off of you because that's hindering you. That's keeping you from doing what I want in you, what I want to bring forth in your life. This is keeping you from it. So I'm going to take that away from you. It's, the analogy I use is, I could use many of them, but before I started doing the Watchman broadcast, I was running a Christian school and a daycare. And for years, that's all I wanted. That's, that was what I thought my calling was. Um, but God obviously had something else in mind. And at that particular time, I got to where I didn't even want anything to do with that school at all. Wanted nothing to do with it. And finally, I just said, I, I just, let's shut it down. Three days praying, fasting, Shut it down. And we shut it down. And I didn't know then what God was going to do. But I could clearly see now that that was in the way. And God said, well, we're going to move that out of the way. Because that, I'm not, you know, I mean, I educated my kids that way. Don't regret it. God may have only had it for that season and then it was time to change. I don't know. But God clearly said, let's shut it down now. And we did. And then that prepared the way for practically everything that we're doing right now. So that's how things work. When you don't understand why we go through some of the things we go through, we endure some of the things we endure, some of the hardships, some of the, um, some of the attacks of the enemy on us, that's God's way, in some cases, of purging that vine. Okay? So that it can bring forth more fruit. Verse 3, now you are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me and I in you as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it abide in the vine. No more can ye except ye abide in me. And then he says again, I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, it's both ways, the same bringeth forth much fruit, for without me ye can do nothing. Now think about these mega churches that have thousands of people going to them. You know they're not preaching the word of God. I mentioned to you, uh, uh, I talked to an old friend of mine who was on staff at a church and he said, Mike, 
He said, we have a paid professional worship team. And he said, I couldn't even tell you their names. He said, because they're not there at the church except for the music part. And then when they've done their bid on stage, they leave. They don't even stay for the service. They're gone. And I'm going, how can this team lead God's people in worship when they themselves do not worship God with what they're doing up on the stage? I don't understand that. So, and obviously, I mean, that church is thriving. It's doing well financially. It's a big church. Okay? Is that because it's that way? Is that evidence that God's in it? No. Not at all. There's 1.7 billion Roman Catholics in this world. It's the biggest quote unquote Christian type denomination in the entire world and they have a lot of money but that doesn't mean that God's in what they're doing okay so you can do nothing without Christ verse 6 if a man abide not in me he is cast forth as a branch and is withered and men gather them and cast them out cast them into the fire and they are burned verse 7 if you abide in me and here it is if ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. Now, are there any conditions set forth here? Yeah, there are a couple. You must be abiding. To abide in Christ is to abide in his word. Knowing what the Bible says. When you know what the Bible says, you know that you can't just pray to heap up treasures to yourselves or heap up things that satisfy the lust of your flesh or the lust of your eyes or your pride. You can't just do that. That's, God's not going to favor that. He's not going to bless that. He's not going to be any part of it. But when you abide in this book and you learn God's kingdom and you learn what God, how God sees things and what God will and will not do, all of a sudden now your prayers and the things that you're asking are lining up with what you know God will do. Okay? So in the case of Hyun Mi, okay? We prayed this morning that God would help her. Okay? Now, I don't know that she's going to get anything of her stuff back. Okay? I don't know that. I can't make that promise to you. What I know beyond any doubt is that God's going to help you even if you don't get anything back, which I know that's probably scaring you, but God's going to give you at least that, if not better than that that I absolutely have I absolutely know okay that and the fact that you know God hates thieves okay except for the one that was on the cross with him that said you know remember me when you come into your kingdom okay he loved that one but he said if you abide in me and my words abide in you that's the key my words abiding in you Ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. Why? Because your will, the thing that you truly want the most, is lined up and is in agreement with what you know God favors. And I've said this many times before. If you're wanting God to bless something that you're not sure is his will, you have to pray an awful lot to try to get it. But if you're doing something that is the absolute will of God, you don't have to strive to ask God to bless it. He's going to bless it. Okay? He's going to bless it. Yes, Tammy. Right.
Mm-hmm. Well, I don't know if God... Yes, of course he did that. Some people lose weight, you lose cancer. Amen. I know. And, and, I'm, and I've always said this, Tammy. I mean, God obviously wanted that for you, okay? To help you. The best form of healing is death. Without a doubt, the best form of healing is death because death brings permanent healing, okay? When you look at death the world's way, that doesn't make sense. When you look at it God's way, it makes perfect sense, okay? So, um, amen. I appreciate you saying that. Uh, and he said, verse 8, Herein is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit, so shall you be my disciples. So, and, and this goes into the part about prayer that I am, you know, I've, I've changed years ago. I, I changed how I prayed about things. I would pray that this, God, this is what I want. This is how I want it, Okay. But then I started praying, God, for your name's sake, for your kingdom's sake, for the sake of your honor and glory, do this thing. Okay? Now, God, you obviously know what my heart desires. And I can't, I don't have any control over that. But God, if this brings honor and glory to your kingdom, then you do what brings honor and glory in your kingdom. And, and again, that's part of... Christ abiding in you, you abiding in his word, his words abiding in you, and you understand what pleases God and what glorifies, herein is my father glorified. The father is glorified by seeing much fruit brought forth on the branches, which is us. Okay, of course God is interested in what goes on in your life. You know, Brother Reg Kelly years ago came and preached this. He said, it's the dumbest phrase in the Bible by the disciples. Master, carest thou not that we perish? Of course he cares. He came and died for them. He's the one more than anybody that cares whether or not they perish. That's his interest. That's his nature. That's his desire. That's his will is that they perish not. Okay. So, now, um, first, first Thessalonians 5. There's a list here. Uh, first Thessalonians 4 deals with the translation. The first part of First Thessalonians 5 deals with um, those who will know generally when the day of the Lord's going to be. That day should not overtake us as a thief. God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. That's verse 9. So let's pick it up in verse 11. 1 Thessalonians 5. Wherefore, cover yourselves together and edify one another, even also as also ye do. And we beseech you, brethren, to know them which labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you and to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake and be at peace among yourselves. And he's about ready to give a list here of things that church people do and should do. 
And he says, verse 14, Now we exhort you, brethren, warn them that are unruly. Comfort the feeble-minded. Um, support the weak. Who in here has got a weakness? Okay. We're not here to downgrade one another's weaknesses. We're not here to look down at others and say, well, I don't know why, I don't know what their problem is, why they have a problem like this. I don't have a problem like that. We're not here for that. We're here to support the weak. Give them a place where they know they can be, where they're loved. Okay? That's what we're here for. And everybody's got a different weakness. Okay? Be patient toward all men. See that none render evil for evil unto any man, but ever follow that which is good, both among yourselves and to all men. Verse 16, rejoice evermore. Again, not the easiest thing in the world to do. So, sometimes instead of counting your losses, count your blessings. There's always something to be thankful for. Okay? Always something. And then verse 17, pray without ceasing. Pray without ceasing. Now, how do we do that? Are we to be monks in a monastery devoting our lives to constant prayer? No, we have things to do. And it takes self-discipline. I can't make you do this. You have to... You have to sort of make yourself, you have to develop habits, okay? Whereby you keep talking to God here with, with your heart. And this, again, this is something I've known that I was going to preach this this week. And I'm telling you, God's dealt with me about that issue. And I admitted to God this week, God, I don't pray enough. I take for granted sometimes because blessings have been there and God's blessed what we've done that they're always going to be there. And then when they're not there, I'm going, what's going on? And then I have to ask myself, Mike, when's the last time you asked God to bless this church, bless this ministry, bless your marriage, bless your family? Bless the work that you do. When, when's the, how often do you do that? And I had to admit to myself, not as often as I should. But it is possible to develop a, a constant or near constant awareness that God is with you everywhere you go, in everything that you do, and He will listen to everything that you talk to Him about. Everything. Okay? Yes? Right. He is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Because of the because of the nature of the role of pastor. I can't just make friends like other guys would make friends because I might have to say something to them they may not like. So I I I kind of guard myself against that because I know my nature if it's somebody I'm close to and I had to say something I may not do it okay and that bothered me years ago until Jesus reminded me what am I chopped liver okay and he is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother so you're exactly right on that 
okay? But you develop that relationship with God to where you are talking to Him throughout the day. You're asking God to help you with this, or God help me with, you know, God lead me in this situation, or somebody's talking to you and you don't know what to say. God help me here, help me, help me out. It is possible to do that, to pray without ceasing. Not all prayer has to be done on your knees at an altar or whatever, or in a church. It can be done all your waking time, okay? Now, uh, turn to Ephesians 6. I had an um, interesting phone call this afternoon uh, before the service, and I, I hated to do this because he was, he was a young man, I could tell. He was asking some questions. And he said, you know, at, at what point are we just going to let Antifa take over our country? You know, um, when are we going to pick up guns and just, and I said, well, we're not unless at some point there might be a cause for it. And I, I you know, I don't want to get too much into that. I said, but you, you got to remember, there's something behind the Antifa members out there. Okay, there's a guy feeding them with money. That's known, but there's also a spirit behind that as well. And you can't shoot spirits with bullets. Can't be done. So, what does he tell us about this armor of God? So Ephesians 6, verse 11, Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand, stand therefore, and then he's going to list them out. Number one, having your loins girt about with truth. Number two, having on the breastplate of righteousness. Number three, your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Number four, verse 16, above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. You think about all the attacks the devil throws at you. Doubt, false doctrine, sin, sinful habits, temptations, those are fiery darts. What's the only way to stop them? Faith. Faith. And then he says, um, take the shield of faith where you'll be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. Verse 17, to take the helmet of salvation because you can't wield any of these other things without being saved. Okay? The helmet of salvation, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, but he's not done. Verse 18, Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. Prayer. Prayer. How do you fight off devils? Prayer. Bible reading. Prayer. Bible reading. Prayer. Bible reading. That's how you fight them off. That's how you get them out, okay? Uh, and I've heard all kinds of things being done. People do rituals and ceremonies. Oh, we're going to cast this devil out. We're going to cast this devil out. We're going to do this. We're going to do that. Prayer and Bible reading. Prayer and Bible reading. Prayer and Bible reading. Prayer and Bible reading, okay? And I promise you, they can't stand up against that. They don't have any power to. That's when God starts bringing more on our side than what's on their side. There are more that are for us than there are against us. Amen? 
That's how we know the election is going to be a landslide, right? Okay. So anyway, those three places I, I had in my notes that they didn't show up there. But So now let's look up on the screen. Mark 14, verse 38. Watch ye and pray. Okay. Um, Paul says that in another place, walk circumspectly. That means be aware, be aware of how the devil works against you. So I mentioned a while ago, who has weaknesses? Everybody raise their hand. Are you aware of what those weaknesses are? And if you are, then that's where you know the devil's going to attack you. Okay? Um, with some people, you can't tempt them with alcohol. You just can't do it. Because alcohol is just not a thing with them. It just doesn't doesn't get them. Um, I mentioned Tom Whitehead this morning. His sister told me that he didn't start drinking until he was 50. Said he just never drank. Something happened with him. And he started, he started drinking. Don't know what it was. But he, they went in, he, his, his sister convinced him to go into rehab. He went into rehab, was doing fine until... His mom died, Sister Bernice, and he lived with her for years, okay? And he couldn't cope with that, so he turned right back to it again. And it's, he's near death, okay? I'm hoping, I'm praying that he comes out of it long enough so he can call upon the Lord. But anyway, that's a, that's a weakness of his. So where's the devil going to, I mean, what was in his mind as he's grieving over his mother? What was, what, what was his impulses telling him? Go drink. You'll, you'll feel better if you just go start drinking again. Okay, that was a trick. That was a lie. That was a setup. So knowing where the devil is going to get you, knowing how he's going to attack you, not being um, ignorant of his devices, okay, is part of that watching unto prayer thing. Okay, watching, looking, watch ye and pray, lest ye enter into temptation. There it is. The spirit truly is ready, but the flesh is weak. And let me tell you, as you get older, your flesh doesn't get stronger to live for God. It gets weaker. But your spirit gets stronger. Okay, that's the difference. Um... Romans 15, 30. Now I beseech you, brethren, for the Lord Jesus Christ's sake and for the love of the Spirit, that you strive together with me in your prayers to God for me. Strive together. Not strive against each other. But sometimes it... We just feel like there needs to be more prayer. Fervent and... Whenever the devil is trying to work against that prayer, that's all the more reason why you should be praying. Because he's working against it. And why is he working against our prayers? Because he knows something. And he knows something he will never admit to you. He knows that God hears those prayers. And when God hears those prayers... He knows that God is going to come after him, the devil, and make him stop doing what he's doing to you and, and against you. Okay? That's why he tries to dissuade us from our prayer life. Um, strive together with me in your prayers to God for me. 1 Timothy 2, 1. Well, let me, let me throw this self-serving statement in. Should you pray for your pastor? Why? Why pray for me? Huh? Okay. Absolutely, Jack. Absolutely. I realized that years ago. When something come over me, 
And I was, man, I was miserable. And I used to go back there and behind the baptistry there, it's just a big storage area. And that's where I would get away from everybody and I would go back there and pray. That was my closet back then. And I couldn't, I had no idea, I didn't understand why I felt this just heavy, heavy oppression on me. And um, it, I, I could tell that it was like compelling me to leave. Just get out, get away, leave. Retire, resign, not retire. Resign, leave everybody. And I'm back there bawling. So God, I don't understand this. What, what is this? And the Holy Ghost quoted, Smite the shepherd, the sheep will scatter. And I went, that's it. He's not after me. He's after the sheep. He don't want me. He wants the sheep. And upon that realization, I mean, it's like Popeye opened up a can of spinach. And I mean, I went, uh, devil, that's not going to happen. Okay, that is not going to happen. I, I mean, I've said this dozens of times too. When I was being electrocuted and was, I was pretty sure that I was going down. The last thing on my mind was, I don't want to leave my wife and kids. Okay, boom, it let go right then and there. And um, so, yeah, it, I, it is, it's not just self-serving that I ask you to pray for me. It is for your benefit that I ask you to pray for me. Okay, and, you know, we'll understand things better when we get to heaven. But for now, suffice it to say... You've heard me say, wherever authority is, is protection. When you remain under that authority, abide under that authority, then God will protect you. Why are they trying to get rid of the police everywhere? They are authority, and they are there to protect. Okay? You get rid of the... So what happens when the St. Louis prosecutor will not prosecute violent crimes? What has happened this year? An explosion of violent crimes. And it's bad up there. Very bad up there. Okay? No, they don't want the protection. They want their ability to do whatever they want to do. And the police are stopping them from doing it. Okay? So anyway, that's how all of that works together. Um... 1 Timothy 2.1, I exhort therefore that first of all supplications, prayers, intercessions, giving of thanks be made for all men. Let's keep reading that. There's more there. 1 Timothy 2.1. 1 and 2 Thessalonians, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, Titus, Philemon, Hebrews, James. Then he says in verse 2, for kings... And for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. For eight years, we prayed for Barack Obama. Well, nobody shot him. And we didn't have a civil war. Now we pray for President Trump. Why? Because I don't want a civil war. Now, there are some things in this country that I do not want God to bless. Okay? I don't say God bless America. I'm, I'm pretty picky about it. God bless this thing about America. But the rest of it, I don't want God to bless that. It's a mess. It's sin. It needs to be dealt with. Okay? But pray for your president. Because he's got many enemies. Many enemies. They run hit pieces all the time time against him they hate him because i think the guy is seriously somebody tweeted this the other day since they arrested galane maxwell have you noticed that they've taken down 
more of these child trafficking networks since they arrested her. What is, if you put those two things together, what does that tell you? She's singing like a bird. She knew who all the traffickers were because that's how she was getting them girls for Epstein. Okay? And so since she's been in custody, I think they've been able to find out more of these networks. Okay? So that's why you pray for kings and for all that are in authority that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty, for this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. 1 Timothy 4, verse 4. Every creature of God is good, nothing to be refused. If it be with thanks, receive with thanksgiving, for it is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. This is how come we can eat bacon, ham, pork sausage, ham hocks, hog jowls, which I was tempted to try that the other day. That looked pretty good. They had them all pre-sliced, and I thought, you know, I, I might try that. Never had them before. You don't know what you're missing, right? Um, but anyway, how, how is it we get to eat all that stuff? It's still an unclean animal. God sanctifies it. And that's what he said. What I have clean, call not thou unclean. So even the food we eat, when it's received with thanksgiving and prayer, it is purified and sanctified by the word of God and by prayer. Uh, very quickly, Christ, the mediator. In the Old Testament... We learned this by way of Moses. When God showed up in Exodus 19 and 20 to speak. See, he spoke the Ten Commandments first to Israel. That's what, that's what you see in Exodus 20. It is God himself speaking the law from the top of Mount Sinai. And when he gets done speaking, the Israelites are going, Moses, tell him to stop. We can't abide that. That's, that's going to kill us. It, it had produced such terror in them. The very voice of God, they begged Moses. They said, Moses, from now on, you go up and talk to him. Tell us what he said. We'll believe you. But we don't want to hear his voice anymore. So the God was showing the institution of the mediator. Moses being the mediator of the old covenant. Moses is dead. So now it's Christ. He's the mediator of the new covenant. He is the one that we go to through Christ to pray. And you cannot, you cannot approach the throne of God without him. You're not worthy and you never will be. Okay? So I'm a stickler for if you're going to pray, finish it in Jesus' name or through Jesus or whatever. John 14, 16, and I will pray the Father and he will give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever. John 16, 26, and at that day you shall ask in my name and I say not unto you that I will pray the Father for you. John 17, 9, I pray for them. I pray not for the world, but for them which thou hast given me, for they are thine. John 17, 15, I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil. John 17, 20, neither pray I for these alone, but for them which also shall believe on me through the word. Paul said there's one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus, he didn't, and he didn't add, and also the mother Mary. He did not add that. It's not there. And I guarantee you 99% of the prayers that the Catholic Church and those who are in the Catholic Church pray, they pray through Mary. Mother Mary, hear us when we pray. That is wicked. Now, Romans 8. Turn there. Romans chapter 8. Um, in Sunday school, we're studying the book of Revelation. John says in Revelation 1, this is what I have up on the screen. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet saying, what was he do? What was that? What does that mean? He was in the spirit. Okay. Jude verse 20 says, but ye beloved building up yourselves in the most holy faith, 
praying in the Holy Ghost. Now the Charismatics will tell you that means praying in tongues. No, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. Okay? Because then how do you know what you prayed? How will you know that God has answered your prayer? And some of these people teach very, 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 this is very close to witchcraft, that when the only way to get God to do these great special things is to pray in tongues, because that's the secret language that when you, when you say these words, that God has to do these things. That's witchcraft. Okay? It's what John D was told by these quote-unquote angels that he was conjuring up in these sessions. They said there's a secret ang uh, angelic language that only us angels know, and it's the language that God used to create the universe and on and on and on and on. It's a bunch of nonsense. Don't fall for that stuff. But praying in the Spirit, here's what Romans 8 tells us. Let's start in... Um, well, we can start verse 26. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. Who's got infirmities? Well, yeah, I've got arthritis here. I got bad ears. My eyes aren't too good. No, more than that. Who's got sin infirmities? Sin infirmities. Okay, sin infirmities. Elijah was a man of like passions as we, yet he prayed, right? So the Holy Spirit helpeth our infirmities. And the fact that we can't see the spiritual realm, we can't see angels, devils that are around us, we can't see into the future, we can't, there's a, there's a million and one things that we can't do, we're not capable of it. So he says the Spirit is there to help us with those infirmities. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought. How do I know what to ask God for? Okay. So with Hyun Mi, we just said, God, help her. God, intervene for her. God, stand for her. Uh, surround her with protection. But how do I know what to tell God to do about this situation where they've got her, all of her stuff, every bit of it, and they won't let her have it? It's a shakedown to what it is, and it makes me mad. But how do I know what to tell God to do when God is the one who actually sees and knows these people better than any of us? Okay? So we just say, God, help. Go through the Psalms, all through the Psalms. David said, I cried unto the Lord. I cried out unto the Lord. What do babies do when they need? They cry. And mom and daddy takes care of it. They, mom and daddy are the ones who know what, the know what to do when the baby's crying. They're the adults. They're the ones who know how to fix the bottle or whatever it is, change the diaper or whatever. The baby doesn't know any of that. We don't demand of our children when they're little babies in the crib. Well, you'll have to tell me what you want. I'm not listening to that crying nonsense. You want me to do something? You tell me what you, tell me what you want me to do. Then I'll do it. God's not that way. He helps our infirmities. We know not what that we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Things that we don't even know how to say. And I've had people over the years tell me, Mike, you've got to spell it out with God. You've got to name it. You have to specify it. And all this nonsense. And I just don't... Go for that garbage. I don't buy into it. Um, Tammy's talking about your cancer. We knew a lady that followed our ministry. We think she's gone on to be with the Lord. Hadn't heard from her for years. But she told me throughout the years that she called our ministry that she was dying. She had some kind of lung problems. She was dying of it. And she had her friends, had her in tears. She would call me in tears. Because her quote-unquote friends, she sounded like she had Job's friends. 
telling her all the time that it's her fault that she's still sick, that she still has this disease in her lungs, that she didn't have enough faith to get rid of it. And if she had enough faith, she wouldn't have this disease. God would just take it from her. I said, don't listen to these people. They are lying through their teeth. I said, have you asked God to take this from you? She said, yeah. I said, has he? No. I said, then obviously God has it there for a reason. A reason that is going to bring glory to his kingdom one way or the other. And God knows that. If God wants you to be free from it, you're free from it. If God wants you to die of it, you die of it. Because guess what? Everybody is going to die. Whether you pray or not, everybody's going to die. Okay? So that's what it means when the Spirit helps our prayers or to be praying in the Spirit is that you just settle it. God, I don't know what to ask for, but God, I need help. God, my children need help in this situation. God, my parents need help in this situation. God, our church needs help in this, whatever. God, I don't know what to do. God, will you do this for us? And then leave it up to God. Amen. Uh, constant prayer. I've dealt with that. First Peter 4, 7. The end of all things is at hand. Be ye therefore sober and watch unto prayer. Being sober means don't get involved with that drunken spirit nonsense. Let me lay hands on your forehead. Let me have you slain in the spirit. We're going to give you a spirit and you're going to be drunk in the spirit and then God will really answer your prayers. Mm -mm. Don't fall for that stuff. Okay. The end of all things at hand, be ye therefore sober and watch unto prayer. Um, I didn't get a chance to record it this week. I've been sick, but the next watchman, I'm, I'm going to continue that part about persecution. And let me tell you, Stephen prayed, was a godly man, a praying man. Did they kill him? Yep. But he got to see heaven opened before he left this world. That's how I want to go. Amen? I want to see heaven open before I leave here to give me that hope. I don't have to be afraid. I don't have to be afraid. Okay? If it's a small thing or if it's a big thing, ask God. And that's what prayer essentially is. Asking. Asking. 